Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harrington. and today I'm hanging outside in the woods on an ideal day to look for mushrooms. And I say it's an ideal day because it's mid-June here in western Pennsylvania. It's really humid today and it's been rainy the past couple of days. So today is the perfect day to look for mushrooms. And so there's one mushroom in particular that I want to show you and talk about in this video because it kind of looks like an oyster mushroom, but it also kind of doesn't look like an oyster mushroom. There's something off about this mushroom. And if you find this mushroom in the wild, I want you to decide for yourself whether you should harvest it or whether you should pass it up based on the information that I provide in this video. And so if you're unfamiliar with oyster mushrooms, oyster mushrooms are some of the world's most popular mushrooms, both in their wild state and also in their cultivated state. In their wild state, they typically grow on woody debris as a decomposer of wood. They grow in shelf-like clusters or some shade of white, cream, tan, or brown. On the underside of the caps, they have decurrent gills that run the complete length of the cap all the way down the stalk, if there is a stalk. And they typically deposit white to pale lilac spore prints. And so let's go find this mushroom that kind of looks like an oyster mushroom. And again, I'll let you decide for yourself whether this one is worth harvesting or passing up. So let's go see if we can find it. Okay, so on my way to finding this oyster-like mushroom, I can't help but notice all the other mushrooms that are coming up out of the forest floor and also out of the woody debris. Again, this is such a perfect day to look for mushrooms. I think I timed it perfectly because of the humidity and all the past rain that we've received. So my basket is filling quickly. It's only been about 10, 15 minutes and I already have about 10 different species in here. Mycorrhizal and saprophytic species. So let me just show you a couple of these real quick before we head on over to the oyster-like mushroom. One of the most beautiful ones in this basket is this Cortinarius mushroom. This is Cortinarius iotes, and the Cortinarius genus is probably the largest of all the mushroom forming fungal genera. It's estimated that there are over 2,000 species in this genus alone. All members are ectomycorrhizal, all members deposit rusty brown spores, and the name Cortinarius comes from the cortina that most of these mushrooms have around the gills when the mushrooms are young, and then they drop to leave a little cortina or a webby veil around the stem. Now what's interesting about this species is that the positive ID can be determined based on the taste of the slime. So you can see that the cap is slimy here and you can even see some spores on here from the mushroom that was sitting on top of it. So it could be Cortinarius iotes if the slime is mild and if it's bitter it could be another look-alike species. So let me taste this. It might look weird but this is perfectly safe to do. and it tastes mild. So this tells me that this is Cortinarius iodes. Let's see what else we have in the basket. Another interesting fungus that I'm seeing right now, and it's one that will continue to fruit all summer through the autumn months, is the poison pigskin puffball, Scleroderma citrinum. Now despite its common name, poison pigskin puffball, it's not considered to be a true puffball. Rather, it's an earth ball. And earth balls have these thick rind-like skins on the outside that cover the spores which are inside. And interestingly, earth balls are more closely related to bolete mushrooms than they are to true puffballs, which are pretty closely related to agaric mushrooms, the typical cap and stem mushrooms. So this is poison pigskin puffball, scleroderma citrinum. There are about 25 species worldwide in that scleroderma genus. The most frequently encountered one here in Eastern North America is probably this one, scleroderma citrinum. Like its common name suggests, this one is considered to be toxic, so we don't really eat this fungus. So poison pigskin puffball, an interesting fungus, but I definitely do not recommend eating this one. What else do we have in this basket? Well, how about these russula mushrooms? We're finding a lot of russula mushrooms today, particularly from this one species. Now, it's not always easy to get a species ID in the field on russula mushrooms. At least we can get down to the group with this one, because this mushroom smells like almonds or cherries. So this is part of the almond scented russula group. They typically have yellow sticky caps and white stems. And russula mushrooms are also colloquially referred to as brittle gills because the majority of the mushrooms in the russula genus are rather brittle. You drop them on the ground or you throw them up against a tree and they'll shatter into a lot of pieces. Now there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of species in the russula genus worldwide. They're all ectomycorrhizal. Here in North America, only about three or 400 are currently described but the actual number of species is probably twice or three times or quadruple that amount. 
Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of people working on the Russula genus, so it's not always easy to get a positive ID here in North America. But we can say with confidence that this is part of the almond scented Russula group. Always a good find just because of the smell. I love it. Okay, so I'll just show you one more out of the basket just to save time so we can get on to finding that oyster-like mushroom. We'll just talk about this last species because it is a crowd favorite. I only found a little bit of it so far. I'm sure if I look around harder, I'll find some more. This is a crown-tipped coral fungus, Artomyces pixidatus. This one is easy to identify amongst all coral fungi because there are three things to keep in mind with this one. It grows on wood, so you're going to find it directly on wood as a decomposer of wood. Each branch ends with a crown at the tip, and this crown features a depression with three to six points all the way around that depression. And if you taste this fungus raw and spit it out, it will taste peppery. So I'm just going to taste a little bit of this. And it takes a couple seconds, 10, 15, maybe even 20. And then afterwards, it's going to leave that peppery aftertaste in your mouth. Make sure you spit it out because you definitely don't want to swallow any wild mushroom raw. And this one tastes peppery. So all these three features help me positively identify this mushroom as a crown-tipped coral. So I'll put this one back. There are other species in here, but to save time so we can get on to find our oyster-like mushroom, I'm gonna stop right here. So let's pick up our basket and head on over to this other mushroom that I promised you that we'd find. Okay, so here's this mushroom that I promised you, this oyster-like mushroom that kind of looks like an oyster mushroom, kind of doesn't look like an oyster mushroom. We're trying to get an ID on this beautiful species right here. There's about four that are fruiting from this dead hardwood tree right here. Now, whenever we think about a classic oyster mushroom, remember, something like Pleurotus ostriatus or maybe a summer oyster mushroom, Pleurotus pulmonarius, we're thinking about smooth caps. We're thinking about gills on the underside that run the complete length of the cap down the stalk. And if the stalk is present, it's usually off to the side, not always. And the stalk doesn't have a ring or a partial veil, and the mushrooms grow in clusters. Whenever we look at this specimen right here, or at least all four specimens, there are a couple of things that are different from our common image of an oyster mushroom in the Pleurotus genus. So which mushroom is this? Well, let's look at some key features of this one. We can see that it's not growing in dense clusters. Each one is growing by itself. It's close by. So it's probably scatter, that's probably the correct term to use here, rather than growing in clusters. Whenever we look at the cap of this mushroom, we can see that it's textured, it's not completely smooth. It's got some hairs on it, it's kind of patchy. When we look underneath, we see that the stalk is very thick, it's very prominent, and it's more centrally oriented. When we think about other oyster mushrooms, we think about stalks that are off to the side, or stalks that are absent, mushrooms that don't even have stalks. This one has a very centrally oriented, prominent, thick stalk. Also on this stalk is a very important key feature. There's a ring around the stem, a ring around the stem on this mushroom right here. Whenever we think about oyster mushrooms, we really don't think about partial veils or onuluses or rings around the stem, but this one has it. And when we look at the cap margin of this specimen, we can see that there are veil remnants, things hanging down from the margin of the cap, which leads us to believe that you know, this mushroom had a partial veil that covered the gills when this mushroom was immature, then the partial veil broke to leave this ring zone around the stem and these veil remnants around the cap margin. So what mushroom is this? Is this an oyster mushroom? Is it a true oyster mushroom? Is it a lookalike? Is it edible? What can we say about this mushroom? Well, believe it or not, this is an oyster mushroom. This is in the Pleurotus genus. This is the veiled oyster, Pleurotus dryanus. So that Pleurotus genus houses at least 40 different species. Some estimates are all the way up to 200 species within that Pleurotus genus. Most of the mushrooms look rather similar, but a few of them are oddballs. And this is one of those oddball species, but it is a Pleurotus mushroom, so it is a true oyster mushroom. It's odd because it has that partial veil, has these veil remnants, got the thick, centrally oriented stalk. Now there is another lookalike species that looks almost identical to the naked eye, and it's Pleurotus lavis. That's another veiled oyster, but the veil on that species is ephemeral and it doesn't last as long. And that mushroom also has a more southern distribution or typically fruits in more warmer climates. This one is Pleurotus dryanus. Regardless of which species it is, Pleurotus dryanus or Pleurotus lavis, both of them are edible. 
Now, some people don't rate this species as highly as Pleurotus ostriatus or Pleurotus pulmonarius or some of the other oyster mushrooms because this one is typically thicker, it's more stout, it's more firm, it's more chitinous. So you have to employ longer cooking methods. And I'm going to harvest some of these and cook them up when I get home. Another interesting thing about this fungus is that it's a classic white rot decomposer of hardwood trees. And so you want to look on hardwood trees for Pleurotus dryanus, late spring, summer through fall. And you could tell that it's a white rot decomposer just by looking at this hardwood log because you could see the white pulpy cellulose that's left behind. So white rot fungi, including this species right here, through their enzymatic processes in the mycelium inside the wood, they secrete enzymes that are very good at breaking down the brown lignin and they leave behind to a rather large degree a lot of the pulpy cellulose and the hemicellulose. So that's what we're seeing right here, this bleached wood. That's a result of the white rot fungi within this log. But Pleurotus dryanus isn't the only white rot fungus here. If I flip this log over, I can see some false turkey tail, Sterium australia. This is a ubiquitous fungus found all year round. And the mycelium of this fungus is also secreting enzymes and degrading the lignin, leaving behind a lot of the cellulose and the hemicellulose. So that's a white rot fungus. This is a white rot fungus as well. So what I'm going to do right now is harvest the two best specimens right here. There are two more that don't look like they grew properly, so I'm going to leave those two behind. But I'll harvest these two and show you what they look like up close. Okay, so one is really large and one is really small. And actually the smaller one doesn't look that great, but the bigger one looks perfect. This is one that I will definitely cook up whenever I bring it home. Now you can see that it's white, but it's also yellowing. As this mushroom matures, it tends to turn very yellowish. But that will still be Pleurotus dryness as long as you go through all the other key identifying features. Now another key feature of this fungus is its smell. Now other mushrooms in the Pleurotus genus might smell like fish or might smell like anise. This one smells somewhat citrusy, almost like grapefruit mixed with a dirty sock smell. That's what I get whenever I smell this mushroom. So whenever you find this mushroom, harvest it and put it up to your nose and you should get that citrusy or grapefruit smell. And I really get it with this. It smells better than it smells worse, but it still has like a dirty sock aroma to it. So I've got a pretty bad specimen right here. It looked good whenever I was ready to harvest it, but it's very floppy, kind of soggy. This one looks much better. So I've got this mushroom. This is a white spore mushroom as well. So if you want to really confirm your identification, take this home, take a spore print. It will be white. We've got Pleurotus dryanus, the classic veiled oyster mushroom, a true oyster mushroom in that Pleurotus genus. Now I'm going to look around, see if I can find some other edible, either mushrooms or plants, and cook some of this up. So after looking around for a bit, I found a few additional ingredients to cook alongside the veiled oyster. And I'll show you very briefly a simple and easy wild food dish that I created once I arrived home. As you can see here, I cleaned and sliced the veiled oyster into strips of equal size. I also have a small amount of crown tipped coral, Artemisia pixidatus, to add to the pan. I found a gilled bolete, Phyloporus rhodoxanthus, and you can tell it's this species because of the yellow mycelium located at the base of the stalk. And I'll remove the stalk before I cook this mushroom. As far as wild plants, I found a nice sized patch of wild garlic. This is one of our native species, Allium canadense, and I'll be adding only the aerial bulblets from the species. And last, but certainly not least, I'll be adding some fresh, tender sassafras leaves that I harvested from a few saplings. And this ingredient will add a nice lemony flavor to the final dish. Basically, I'm going to add all the ingredients to a cast iron skillet and cook for a few minutes before adding some salt and pepper. So nothing too fancy. It's very simple, yet the final product will be quite tasty. I decided to start with ghee as my fat of choice, and then I added all the mushrooms to the pan before I added the plants because the mushrooms will take the longest to cook. After about five minutes of cooking, I added the wild garlic bulblets and allowed all of this to cook for another one or two minutes before adding in the seasonings, which included salt, pepper, and the fresh sassafras leaves. And that's it. All these ingredients were wild minus the salt and pepper, and all the ingredients were harvested within 10 minutes of looking around. I could definitely tell that the veiled oysters were in this dish because they were the most meaty and texture rich of all the ingredients and they did taste really good. So I do rate this species as one worth foraging if you find it at or a little before its peak stage of harvesting. 
Once the veiled oyster becomes fully mature, it tends to get soggy, buggy, and quite stinky. So, the veiled oyster, a mushroom that kind of looks like an oyster mushroom, but in some respects it doesn't look like an oyster mushroom, but it is a true oyster mushroom, Pleurotus dryanus. I hope you learned something about this interesting and edible fungus, and I hope you also learned some new things about some of the other mushrooms in wild plants that we discussed in this video. And just as a final note, I encourage you, whenever you're out here foraging for plants and mushrooms, to reciprocate the act by also harvesting any trash that you will encounter. Every single time I'm out in the woods, every single time I'm foraging, every single time I'm filming these videos, I inevitably encounter trash and I realize that if I don't pick this stuff up, especially in these more remote areas, who else will? And for all that I've been given over the years, all that I've been provided, this is the least that I can do. And so I encourage you to reciprocate the act of foraging every single time you're out in the woods or parks or forests to also harvest any trash that you encounter and also to influence others to do the same. It's a seemingly simple act, but with huge rippling effects. So thank you one more time for watching this video and I applaud you for learning something new about your land. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. You can also head on over to learnyourland.com and sign up for the email newsletter. Thanks again, I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.